Hi, hello, yes, good, talking, talking, hi, hello, all right, neat. So when are we supposed to be done? Ten. at the end. Ben you guys have a bunch of diagrams of systems right now. I know they're super exciting to look at, but uh, you guys can put them away for the moment. We're going to get there. I don't want people to get overwhelmed with information because I promise we're going to get there. And some of them may look different from systems that you guys are used to, so we'll talk about it. All right, ready break. My name is Patrick Stewart. I've been with ETC for working on 19 years. Uh, you got my bio, you can read all about me. Uh, I'm a gear guy, I am not a lighting designer. I've only done lighting design and board up out of necessity to keep food in my plate. Um, so I'm a gear guy, so when you got gear questions, I'm your guy. All right, so this is what we're gonna try to do in this 65-ish uh, minutes that we have. We're gonna understand the big components. Uh, and we're gonna, so David kind of hit on the whole power control concept of what everything is everything is kind of evolved to. Uh, so we're going to define that. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit how power control in our in our world kind of came to be. Um, 
types of user controls. And then our fixtures are now turning from single parameter to multi-parameter. We're going to touch on that. And if you are an ETCP person like myself, we have a form up here for you to sign before you leave. This will get you credits. All right? So ready, break. So here's our five things. We're not really going to touch a lot about on distro. Distro is pretty simple for you guys. That's everything from the power control device out to the world. And we're not going to really talk about infrastructure a whole lot because that's what we're going to do when we go to the drawings because that's all about infrastructure. So we're going to concentrate on the three in the middle, your power control, your user control, and your fixtures. Okay, distro. That's the little boxes on the very end where you plug your lights in. Okay, I haven't lost anybody. If if I lose you, like deer in the headlights, scream your hands up. Otherwise, we're going to go through this 20 minutes of pretty pictures, and then we're going to get into the good fun stuff. All right, so early power control. Who's been around long enough to remember big high wattage dimmers in big, massive rooms? Okay, so the concept was big dimmers, lots of circuits patched to those big dimmers. That's, that's where we started. And then we came to high density dimmers which is our little sensor rack on the right, because we were just controlling these single lights. So you had a single circuit on a single dimmer. And then we were using a console or some sort of user device to put those dimmers together in a usable, easy, usable, usable fashion. Right, so we're evolving. Well now, we are asked to do things like fluorescent dimming. Okay, forward face and reverse phase, all these kind of unusual loads that we'll talk about a little bit later in one of the later classes. We're, we're starting to ask, being asked to do all those things and now to today we're being asked to switch off power supplies to other fixtures. Right? So the little module over here on the right hand side which you'll see more about can do all three. It can be a dimmer, it can be a relay, and it can be a constant circuit. All in one. And that's kind of the evolution of power control. So think of power control as possibly a dimmer. So yes, this picture is hard to read, but over there on the right hand side is a sensor rack next to a switching device. Right? And that's what your modern dimmer enclosure rooms are going to start to look like. Right? You also we also are starting to see a lot of distributed dimming. So up in the middle is a source 4 dimmer. So it's a single dimmer that mounts to the side of a source 4 bar or it can just hang on a pipe. And then you also start are starting to see the color source relays. So distributed dimming and control as opposed to centralized. So who has five, six dimmer racks in a dimmer room? That's starting to switch to five or six dimmer rooms. Okay? And even four dimmer rooms with a whole bunch of distributed stuff all over the place. Okay, so that's, that's the evolution, so now it's called, we refer to it as power control. So how do we control the power to all these devices? Okay, user control, so architectural. Any of this look familiar to anybody? Anybody got this in your spaces? Okay, you got echo line on the left hand side, you got paradigm line on the right hand side, fader stations, slider stations, button stations, you got 10 button station back there on the back. You can walk around the building, this is an ETC building. So you got your LCD station right there. So you see the user controls for architectural all over the place. And as we go through the prints, we'll go from simple system to super complex system. And we're going to see how all that stuff interacts with each other. And then our user controls. Yes, we do have high-end consoles. There's no pictures up here. I'm not sliding them. You got the color source family on the left. You work up through the EOS line. So how many have ever seen all of our consoles all together in one little snapshot? Okay, so what's the difference as they evolve up through the line from the, from the one in the top center to the bottom right? What do you notice is different between them? Hardware. So it's mostly software except for the uh, ION console, the keyboard's different, but it's mostly hardware. They speak the same, they talk the same, they feel the same. Okay, it's, it's very important to us that we maintain that. So it's, it's all about your user experience. So you decide what you want, your space decides what you want, we got a console for that. That's a lot of stuff that CAT works with as well. 
It's what the FPCs work with. So when, you're, when your system becomes a system, there's got to be some, he, he said, a, what was it, a vision control that he talked about this morning? Marketing strategy, right? Your space has to have that same vision. You've got to know where you want to be in 10 years, and you put yourself in a console that does that. If you have no desire to do anything moving lights or any multi-parameter fixtures, you don't need a TI. Right? If you're going to be all about multi-parameter fixtures, like really all about multi-parameter fixtures, you don't need an element. Because you will not be happy. <laughs> right? So there you go. That's user control console. Okay, fixtures, single parameter. So now we have the classic source for. Everybody knows what a source for is. One fixture, one lamp, one dimmer, super simple. We also have LED fixtures that are coming online that are single parameter as well. So you can see our GDS fixtures. And oh, by the way, all of this stuff is across the hallway. So on your spare time, go to the hallway. You've got further questions. Okay, so this is the evolution. On the right-hand side, you've got your filament lamp. We love our filament lamps. We know our filament lamps. We know how to control our filament lamps. We know how to change their colors. They have a life of their own. To the multi-parameter guy on the left-hand side. Seven to five to four, depending on the fixture, different color emitters packed into some sort of a package. Multi-parameter. So there's your first high-end slide, or high-end picture. So you got a high-end moving lights. Can be up in the neighborhood of 35 parameters to run a mover. 40 parameters, 50 parameters to run a mover. As opposed to one up and down, it's 40. So that's where everything has kind of changed. It's a quantum leap forward as these multi-parameter fixtures really start to blossom and become more and more complex. The control devices to run them obviously have to get more complex, which means the infrastructure that hooks them all together gets more and more complex. Follow? Simple? May not. Okay, infrastructure. Again, we're not going to cover a lot on infrastructure. We're going to hit all of that when we go into the um, to the papers. Are you have any questions before we get into systems? How are we feeling? How many of you all have uh, spaces with large consoles, say like a TI, a Geo? Okay, how many are elements? How many don't know? How many are technicians versus, how many are technicians? Okay, how many are just administrator, you just kind of like work in the space? So we're mostly technicians and we're split 50-50 between small theaters and large theaters. Okay, that's pretty good. So that means that our job prints are going to be good as well because we're going to start with what would probably be considered um, like a hotel, like your lobby space. So I cut off the name of the job print, but if you pull up the job print, you will see it look like this. Frederick Douglass. Right? And then we're going to let Kat talk to you a little bit about how all these parts and pieces and pretty little pictures that we saw become a system. All right. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on what I do because somebody might hear project manager and you guys are a lot of wonderful end users, you might not work with ETC's project management team. Um, how a project manager gets involved is through the duration of the project, we're working on your system before it even comes to your theater, to your space, to your school, anything like that. Um, when you order a system from ETC, when your purchase order from your facility comes in and you're going to get your brand new console, your brand new dimmer racks, your brand new networking equipment, you get a project manager. <laughs> and that project manager, in this case me, is going to work with whoever purchased the system, which is probably a dealer um, that you might work with. Does anyone know what a dealer is? You guys know what a dealer is? Okay, great. Um, so we'll work with the dealer to make sure that that system is tailored for what you need in your space. Um, so project managers will help uh, do some job prints for it to show what your space is going to look like. Because everybody wants to know how their space is going to function before the equipment arrives, right? That's probably a smart plan. Okay. 
So this is a pretty small system right here. This is probably what some of you are used to seeing. Um, what we have on this is a smart fade control system. That's one of our light boards that um, we are sunsetting, so we will not be um, we will not be producing it anymore, but there's still a lot of great color source, or I'm sorry, there's a lot of great smart fades out there. We have this beautiful new color source console if you haven't checked it out yet, which, uh, you yeah. know, anyway, very similar. So the smart fade system, um, you've got this little control console. It's pretty simple. Um, if you have a smart fade, you probably don't have moving lights in your system, um, but it's going to plug into a DMX plug-in station. And then that DMX plug-in station is going to talk to your dimming rack. What's cool is that we actually have one of these DRD dimming racks right here. Um, so the DRD racks are pretty simple. You've got dimmer modules in them. I'm going to open this up real quick. And if you guys want to take a closer look after class, that's cool too. Ugh, cable. Okay. So we've got dimming modules in here. We've got your processor, which is the brain of your system. And we've got that DMX cable coming in from the DMX plug-in station into this dimming rack. So when you are on your console and you're saying channel one at full, that DMX signal is coming in, talking to this dimmer rack, and it's going to turn on a dimmer at full. Pretty simple, right? Um, how many of you guys have systems that are pretty small, like this one? Like a black box or like a little lobby, lobby okay. system? So it's pretty easy, right? You have your control console, you plug it into your DMX station, you turn on lights. Great, easy. Um, you can see also on this riser that we show a little bit of the distribution that Patrick was talking about. We've got a connector strip on there. The numbers on the connector strip, if you're curious, um, that's a code for us to be able to build it for you. Um, the 99 on it is the series number. The 08 after it means that it's eight feet long. The uh, 4CP, C is our um, terminology for twist lock connectors. So you have four twist lock connectors. The dash two means that they're on two circuits and the L means it's left terminations. That's a lot of things I just threw at you. It means what side the terminations are on, so what side your wire is coming into the connector strip. You may not have to worry too much about that, but we make sure to put it on our drawing sets so that whoever you are buying your system from can make sure that they can come back to you and say, hey, this is what you want, right? This is what's gonna work best in your space. This is gonna be great for you. Awesome. So after we send out these job prints, your dealers, your reps, the people that you work with to purchase a system will have that conversation with you. You will say, great, I love this little system. It is perfect for my black box. And they'll get back to me, I'll say, great, let's send it your way. And that is essentially what a project manager does is we help facilitate that here at the company for you. So while I may not get to talk to you lovely people every single day, I'm working here for you guys too. So. That's a really quick basis on how we put it together. Does anyone have any questions on this one? Because it's going to get a little more complicated. Yeah. Is it DMX all the way through? For this one, yes. So your so your infrastructure is super simple on this one. You got a plug station which is furnished by ETC on page mm -hmm. number eight. DMX, which is part of the installation. So mm -hmm. that's going to be a built-in cable that's going to be run through there, permanently wired to your rack. So infrastructure here, two pieces. Distribution, two pieces. Super simple. And one of the things that you'll notice on these job drawing sets is that down in the corner it says control wiring legend. This is for your electrical contractor or, or whoever is installing the system so that they're making sure that when we say DMX cable, they know what actual cable to be putting into the walls. So if you see the little D on our drawing here, here it says D1, that means DMX run one. You can look down here and see that, oh, that's a build in 9729. And while you guys may not be the ones putting that into your building, because they're, they're hardwired as opposed to the control cable that runs from your console, um, that way we can make sure that we're specifying what you need for your system and what's going to make it run efficiently. Who's seen drawings like this in their space? Oh, awesome. Oh. 
yeah. You guys keep asphalt. We Good love that. Deal. So that's awesome. <laughs> so how many of you guys have run into a problem with your system before? Something's not working the way that you expected. Great, okay, about half the room. It's okay, you, you guys can tell us. These things happen. Um, so Sasha at the back of our room is a part of our lovely um, tech support team. Um, and when you call into tech support and you say, oh my gosh, I have a problem, if you have job prints, this will give us a lot of information. So if you guys have these in your space, so keep your them number, somewhere safe. Your number down here? I know this is not your space, but if it was your space, it'd be pretty awesome. Yeah. If you if you give them that number when you say so, I'm calling about job number blah 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 blah. They can actually look up your prints and have them sitting right in front of them when you're asking questions. Sometimes they get these from you guys. In other words, like a, I'm at a high school, so they always know my information from the high they? school. But like, can I get these prints from you guys? Yeah, you can call and you can request it. We can we can uh, there's we can't always send out like every type of drawing. Right. Um, like if you were to call and say, "Hey, I want all the job set drawings from this random project number that I gave you today." I wouldn't be able to provide that to you, but if you're the end user, we could work on getting you something that works for your space. Cool. Yeah, some prints are, you know. Big. I have a I have a job set on my desk that's about this thick. That's why I'm here today and not looking at it. So. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. If um, a different company uh, set up your infrastructure, would having a map like this still be helpful? In yes. The so the kind of the rule of thumb about other third-party infrastructure is we're, this building is on a third-party infrastructure, so the, the building controls the infrastructure, so the wireless, everything is working together. That's great. We don't say that you can't do that. Yeah. But think about it this way. So this is our philosophy. You're in the middle of your most dramatic scene and you gotta fade to black. And it say it goes over 10 seconds. And you hit that button, it starts to fade and then somebody in the office decides to do an update and clogs the server and the server hiccups, even if it's for a second. What are your lights gonna do when they catch back up to your console? They're not gonna go fade. They don't, they're not smart enough to know. All, know. all they know is that their status changed from here to here and it's just going to go boom. So your nice, smooth, dramatic fade is no longer <laughs> yeah. a nice, smooth, dramatic fade. Right? So yes, it is networking. It is all the same thing. You can do few, uh, port, V ports, V ports. You can do all that kind of stuff on a corporate network. It's all good to go. That's your caveat. Okay, so yes, if you're, if you're running on a third party infrastructure, you should definitely understand how that works. So our, our lighting system in our factory is also the corporate network, right? So they VLANed it all over the place. I don't have it. Mike has a copy of it. The IT guys know how to do it, but when we need something, we go to the IT guys and they double check it. Okay, it all takes time. Sometimes in the middle of performance, you don't have time. Sometimes in the middle of performance, you don't have your IT guy there. Okay, so if it's a closed network, that's the best because you have control. And I also want to point out not to say that if you do not have these drawings at your facility that we're not going to be able to help you. If you call and you say, hey, here's the information I have. I'm at, you know, my name is this. I work at this high school, this college, this theater. Um, here's what I know. We're going to be able to try to help you. We're not gonna go, oh, you don't have a job number? Bye, and hang up, that's, that, no. We will help you. We've even helped you guys with things that haven't been ETC equipment, so. <laughs> so we're here to help. What we're trying to say is that if you have um, any kind of information about your job and you wanna call in and talk to a technician, um, it, it helps to have it available because it's just more tools on how we can help you. Cool. I'm not yeah. But something that I've run into is, okay, we have that picture, but it doesn't tell us where it is. Correct. Like, That's in, correct. Physically in the building, and we're like looking at ceiling panels, and like yep. sure. crawling into closets going, okay, where is this cable? <laughs> and to be checked. And that's actually a really good point. One of the reasons that we don't always include that on our drawings is um, ETC, while we build a system and while, you know, if you tell us you want a dimmer rack or if you want a button station or whatever you want, we'll show you how they go together, but we can't necessarily dictate where they go in your space um, because we're not engineers. 
we have system engineers. We can do you know all kinds of technology, but we're not. We don't um, stamp engineering drawings. Um, that's that's essentially what it comes down to. And whenever we have the information, we try to put it onto our drawing set. Like if we know that this control console. Um, is called something else by your company or it lives in the control booth or anything like that, we'll notate that on our drawings as a little side note. Um, we see that a lot especially with could, our plug-in stations and with our button stations is we try to show a location of them but we don't, we can't necessarily show where wires are running through the walls or um, specific plans. Some of the larger as-built, if, if they do a full-on as-built redraw, if the, if the technician is going to like put a junction box, maybe put third floor or something something because it seemed important to him at the time or her at the time, some of that stuff makes it on the as-built if we can fit it in. But a lot of that as-built stuff, you're kind of relying on your EC, the electrical contractor, to have put that in their as-built as to how that conduit got from point A to point B. Otherwise, we're trying to fish back maybe through the install tech to see if the install tech so even after you, I did our performing arts center here in Madison, and even five years after I did the install, they're, get, they're calling me going, where was that junction box at? And I'm trying to go back through my mind to remember where it was at. So. That's a good question, though. That's a very That's a good great question. question. A lot of times the, electric, the electrician's drawings and the, these as yep. built, like there's Nope. There's pieces that just weren't important to the electrician. Nope. Yeah, and sometimes it's hard to correlate between two very different drawing sets. We try to reference where we can, but um, there's only so much that we can put on our drawings. Oh, very good question. Yeah. And we all feel your pain. <laughs> right, so we're going to get a little more complex. We're going to take the distribution out of it. And now we're going to add an architectural station. So this one is uh, Barbara Bush Middle School. This one features one of our brand new uh, color source consoles. Yeah. So uh, this one is a little bit more complicated than, um, this one is a little bit more complicated because we're going to throw in some architectural control in this one. But it's still a pretty simple system if you take a look at it. Can anyone tell me what is the same about this system from the one that we just looked at? Yep, it's DMX controlled. Mm -hmm. Anybody else notice something? The unison, uh, the unison control unit DMX as well. Yep. Yep. So we've got the DRD rack in here again. And this, once again, is a rack that has both dimmers and a processor in it. We didn't talk too much about the processor um, for the last one, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about it because we've got a brand new thing in this one. And that is um, a Unison Heritage Control Station. It says Unison UH30407. What does that mean? Okay. Um, kind of like our connector strips, we have a little methodology for being able to tell you what exactly is on is that button station. Uh, UH means Unison Heritage. It's the style of button station. It's the one that's on the back wall. It's the one that's right here. They're like these very nice, clean, button stations right here. Um, the three is how many gangs it is, so gang size, so three gang wide. Uh, the four is how many faders there are on it, so the little up and down guys. Um, and then the seven is the actual buttons on it. So from this, it's a three gang wide station, um, four faders, seven buttons. That's this guy right here. Four faders, one, oh, two, yeah. three, four, five, six, seven buttons. So that's your station. Yep. So if you take a look at um, your drawing, you'll notice that the cable between, the, between that button station and the DRD rack is a little bit different, right? It says U instead of D, right? What that is is what um, we refer to as unison wire here at ETC. Um, it's a LAN cable that basically um, is a protocol that we can use to, um, to run from the button station to the processor. It's not DMX, so that's the one, one thing. I know we kind of live in a DMX world where we go, oh, I understand DMX. There are channels. There are um, 
you know, I program that on my console. That's very easy for me. Um, this one we want you to think a little bit more architecturally. So you have these buttons. When you press buttons, something's going to happen, right? How many of you guys have button stations like this in your space? What happens when you press them? This isn't a trick question, I promise. <laughs> what? Right, right. It's a pre-programmed look. Maybe it's your house lights. Maybe it's a queue. Um, maybe it's a spotlight on stage. Where does this information live? It lives right here in the processor. Good answers. Oh my gosh. You guys are more awake than most people are at this. <laughs> so, okay. So that's right. That's what's so great about this DRD unit is that it has an internal processor. So not only is it going to take DMX signal in from your light board, it's going to um, remember all these presets that go with your button station. So whether you're working at a light board or you're just walking into the theater first thing in the morning and trying to get some lights on stage, you have the ability to do that either from your console or from your button station. Yes? So are those That is such a good question, <laughs> and we are going to come back to it. In this case, with the DRDs, they are a part of the dimmer rack. But she brings up a really good question, and that was, are they always in the dimmer rack? And the answer is no, they are not. In these very simple systems um, where we're trying to kind of save space, or maybe you don't have a ton of dimmers in your space, yes, they can live all together. But we're going to take a look at systems um, where they don't and talk about why, why that might be. Cool? So this could be like your little lobby system, standalone lobby system. It could, it could also be integrated and connect, interconnected to your main system. Um, but so you got a small, your small little dimmer rack, you got some lights that are hardwired, and you got some sta and a station on the wall. And it's super simple. Right? So now we're going to take it out again. Figure out what this one is. Oh yeah, this one is Tipton Elementary. Okay, so now we're adding some complexity. So now we have our first non-dimming cabinet. So we have an echo relay panel in the mix. So we're doing more than just dimming lights. We're now controlling some other switch devices. We still have our, our same infrastructure concept coming input to it. And then we have a new protocol, a new, uh, a new infrastructure wire, and that's going to be unison with voltage. So that's going to be a station like an LCD. In this case, right. it's actually a portable station. Yeah, portable. Okay, um, you can see that there's a little control cable that says, um, extension cable on it. I did not bring my real glasses today. Okay, so you can see a little cable that says extension cable on it and you can see that it's plugging into the system. That's actually one of the, these little guys. So this is a portable touch screen unit. The reason that there is a slightly different um, control cable type on this is that you do need extra voltage to power the station. Right. Right. Well, no, I need extension. well, well, I need it, it's it's a it's a combination. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's this signal, mm -hmm. it's communication, communication, exactly the same. Same. Okay. Same communication. This guy to function to come alive needs voltage. Okay. So it needs it needs sense? twelve. It needs an auxiliary DC voltage. Twenty four volt. volt now. Okay. I've been out of the install game for a while. <laughs> don't don't trust me. That's why we put it on your drawing, so we can tell you. Yeah. So um, remember how earlier the question was asked, well, I don't know where this is in my space. I don't know what this is called in my space. This is actually a good example of when ETC starts to get a little bit more information. See how um, on those unison button stations, it says CS1 and CS2? When we received the job prints for these drawings, that's what they called their button stations. Um, we want to notate that because sometimes for whoever is installing the gear, they go, well, I have what's called a CS1. I know that the CS1 lives in the booth, so what's the CS1? Right here. 
So when we have that information, we do try to incorporate that into our drawing sets. So if you see something like that, that's what it means. Um, it may not mean much to you, which is okay, but that's the naming convention for when the job came in. And everybody has a different naming convention. There are how many theaters all over the world? There are that many different ways to name your button stations. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's talk about what's similar with this system and the last system. Anyone see anything that is the same? We are still using the DRG rack. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, what about the button stations? Can anyone take a guess on what button station or we are using here? Yes, yes, great job. So what did we talk about before with the button stations on these drawings? You can decode them by the first two letters, Unison Heritage for UH. Uh, the one is for one gang. There are no faders on this one, so we just put a few zeros there instead. And then it's one button because it's followed by the one. Yeah, it could be. Um, a lot of times when I see them, they're very simple on-off buttons. Um, sometimes in ballroom spaces like this one where you have a partition wall, sometimes it's open and close so that you can have two different looks or you can let your lighting system know, hey, there's a partition in here, maybe we want to control the lights a little bit differently, which is more complicated, which we can get into mm -hmm. soon, I promise. Does that make sense? Yes? This may seem like a really simple question, but is there a reason that CS1 and CS2 are connected to the dimmer rack in a linear fashion versus a separate connection? That is a really good question. That is a good really question. good question. So, that is without not going a silly like question. super, super deep into this, you got two basic philosophy, or you have two basic topologies. You have daisy chain, which is what you see right there, Easy. because it makes a really pretty drawing. And then you have star topology, which is what networks are. So networks all go like this, from a central point out. Unison doesn't care. Yeah. Okay? Unison so yes, can fire yes it's drawn button. really pretty by, like this, but it actually could be a junction box sitting up here, coming from the DR rack to a junction box and then go like this to both stations. It doesn't care. Unison doesn't care. DMX cares. We know DMX. DMX has to be daisy chain. Okay? Fantastic question. So you have networking topology, you have unison topology, or our architectural topology, and you have our DMX topology. DMX is daisy chain, networking is star, architectural can be anything it wants to be. So when you're daisy chaining in that system, is the uh, unison box that you're passing it through doing any active repeating, or is that all passive? It could care less. They're mimicking each other. So, you don't, you don't so everything, everything happens at the processor. So when I press the button, it goes to the processor. The processor says this button has just been pressed because every station has a unique ID. And then it sends back out LED functionality. So you can notice this LED is on. So if I were to press another button, it's going to send a command back to the processor, which in this case is miles away. And it's going to come back and tell that light to come on and, any, and that light to come on. But so that they mimic each other. I guess what I'm asking is you don't gain any extra max cable distance from that because it's not doing any signal. No, either. correct. And you're limited to 1,600 feet of cable, period, okay. for the entire system, whether it's star, daisy chain, it doesn't matter. If you have, um, like let's say you're working in a theater where you want to add more button stations and you are concerned about station length, that's definitely something to talk to your dealer about when purchasing equipment because there are ways around it. We do offer equipment that can extend systems. Um, we do offer ways of maybe not physically extending that line, but things that we can put in the line that will extend the length. Good question. Really good question. Yeah, great question. Yes. yes. What is the RCC one? Like, what are those, the bottom boxes? Oh, that's a really good question. I hadn't gotten there yet. Um, no, it's great. We love questions. Don't ever apologize for asking a question. Um, so in this case, the RCC one, um, this is kind of a dual oh. station. We have the ability at, at ETC to make pretty much whatever you want. I, that's a really dangerous thing for me to say, <laughs> but we can, especially well, when it comes to. It's all about this. You <laughs> well, got the whenever, money, we'll make it. Well, whatever's going to work for your system. So we talked about earlier how this system in particular has one of these little plug-in stations. Um, it also 
wants to be able to take DMX into the system as well. It's not shown on these drawings, but this system has a console. Not purchased by ETC, but that's, a, that's okay. Um, <laughs> but we want to be able to get DMX into the system as well as something to plug this into. We could do that by having two separate plugs you know, one to plug this into, one to plug your DMX into. But the customer decided that they wanted to, you know, save a little bit of space, maybe not drill so many holes into their wall, so we were able to combine those into one unit. So you have two types of wire going to that unit. You have the one for unison here with voltage, and you also have DMX going into it. So that station is an input for both this as well as your console. Something like two connectors on it. Yep, it's typically a two gang, two gang station, and you'll have a unison connector and a DMX connector right next to each other, and some fancy, nice little uh, laser engraving above that says DMX, portable, or unison, whatever. Mm -hmm. Right? Or whatever you'd like it to. So say. one of the neat things about this one, if you think about it for a little bit, is you have DMX going into it from a console, right? And then you have some DMX coming out of the unison rack going to a relay rack, right? You see that? So how do you think that's happening? Are we converting it to S? Oh, no. No, we're, 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 too sim we're too simple for this system right now. <laughs> so what this can do, okay, it can do two things. One is it, it, it can see DMX come into it, and it can pay attention to it. Okay? And in a lot of cases, the wire, it can just jump off and go on to the next device. Or the other neat thing it can do is it can send out DMX as well. Right? So your console can speak to all of this stuff. And your architectural system can speak to all of this stuff all at the same time. So they're all parallel. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because we have a processor in this unit, we can take in DMX as well as send DMX out with it. And in this case, it's talking to an echo feed-through panel. And if you haven't had a chance to check out our echo feed-through products or our echo mains bed pa panel, please, they are right across the hall. We can go take a walk after this class. We'll point them out to you. But in this case, you might go, OK, OK, I've got some dimmers. Then I've got a relay panel. Why would I have a relay panel mixed with dimmers? Yep. Yeah. LEDs, movers, those are, those are exactly some of the reasons why we started uh, putting out products like this. Is we recognize that in this changing world of lighting technology, we have to kind of change our game a bit. We have been dimmers for years. Back when we purchased LMI, when I was in grade school, but, um, <laughs> but we have to be able to adapt to the customer's needs, right? So we wanted to offer products that, um, that adapted with that. So that's why we have things like relay panels, to be able to be there for moving lights, to be there for LED fixtures. Cool? So you're just talking about on-off. Yeah, it's essentially on-off. Um, so. Not to blow your mind too much, but the little relays that are in these, um, for the mains fed panel, not for the feed through, but we can actually put 300 watt dimmers in those now. So if you have a space that's mostly LED or you need um, or you need mostly relay power or anything like that, you can go ahead and put in a little 300 watt dimmer to take care of your couple of incandescent loads so on that there. Rack, that rack is getting data the whole time. Yep. So. Mm -hmm. yep. so the difference between these two guys is your mains feed is just like any other install rack. So you have breakers in the top already fed, pre-wired in the factory to the relays below. So your contractor sends mains feed in and then relay outputs out. In a lot of your places, you probably have two separate things. You have a breaker panel, and then you have a relay panel sitting next to it or in some other part of the room. Okay, That's called a feed-through. So we make both. So the main feed's all in one. Every, the relays and the breakers are all in one cabinet, whereas this has to have a breaker cabinet somewhere off to this, in another location. Because it's got to have a breaker. And then the sensor IQ rack, which is this guy right here, has the breaker and the relay all inside the breaker. And there's one of those over there as well. And, that, and with the sensor IQ rack, you actually get load feedback. So you, you know when the breakers trip, all that stuff that you come to trust and count on from a sensor rack, you get that with an IQ rack as well.
All right, so we were on that one. All right, our next one. Before we move on to the next one, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, just going back to running the U7 DMX, to that system, can we dictate which takes precedence? Yes. So can you, so it's a, it's a priority. You can set the priority whether, so how many have lo, like a lockout station in your facility? Where you, or a LCD station with a lockout function? Yeah, that's one way to take precedent. That's All right? Hour, right, <laughs> right, exactly. So you can actually tell Paradigm to do it for you. So when it sees DMX, it just lets go of the unison and now DMX has got control. But you're getting a little all DMX You can tell it to do a you can tell it to do a lot of different things. So now you're starting to get really outside of what we're trying to do today. But yes, the answer to your question is yes, yes, and yes. It's all a matter of how you operate. Okay, whether you want a button station on the wall or whether you want to turn on your console and have it just take over and auto do control, it's totally up to you. I should mention that um, one of the things we've been talking about, because Patrick brought up the word paradigm, is these control processors that we've been working with, with the Unison Heritage button stations, um, they work with what's called our paradigm processor. Um, Paradigm is kind of like our gold standard at ETC. It's very highly customizable. Um, it's very flexible. It can be programmed in a variety of different ways. We're giving you guys kind of some basic case studies, some very basic projects to start going out on. But if you have questions on what, what can Paradigm do for me, how can I adjust it to do something very specific in my space, we will get you some answers because um, some of it may take some reprogramming of your space, some of it might be simple things that we can just instruct you how to do, but these are, Paradigm has pretty customizable levels, um, so we just kind of wanted to point that out, that there's a lot that it can do, and it's a lot that we're probably not going to cover here today. How long right. is Paradigm been around for? So I have a facility that's 20 years old, so... 10 I years, that. 7 years? 7 ish years, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I struggled with Unison, all through my install days, and then as soon as I got out into trade shows, we came out with Paradigm, and it's like 100 times easier. Yeah. <laughs> so if I have to reprogram something to use, and then I have to... You need to talk to yeah. one of the service people, because there's multiple layers of different ways. So you're, you're, you're basically running the parallel thing. You've run into your space. You may, be, you may be done some changeover. You may be doing things a little bit different, and you're running into hiccups. Don't struggle. Please don't struggle. Give us a call. Yeah. There's multiple different ways we can help. It may be that you need to get a, a service tech to come out and do a reprogram for you. It may be something we can walk you through over the phone. But don't struggle with the way a system was originally designed because you may not be that person or your facility may have changed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the kind of the, the moral of the story is, is don't struggle. We're 24-7 and available, you know, available for your questions. Please give us a call. There's multiple ways to fix things. What's that? That too. <laughs> All right, where are we at? That too. All right, so we are moving on to. Now we're getting into the fun stuff. Clark. Clark Elementary School. So this one has a few things that we've looked at before on these slides, but we're also going to throw in some new elements on here. Um, what is what is similar? I would, oh, you're right. It's not an element. I I apologize for what should have been a joke, but was not. Okay. So so what is the same on here? What is similar to what we've seen? What gear looks familiar to what we might have talked about earlier today? Relay panel. Relay panel. Yep. We've got a color source console. We've got some connector strips. DMX plug-in stations, yep. But we've got a couple of new pieces of equipment here. Um, let's start with the Echo. So we haven't really talked about Echo too much yet. Echo um, came out a couple of years ago, and it is more for simpler systems. We talked about Paradigm kind of being the gold standard of functionality um, where it's very highly customizable. Um, Echo is 
Echo has a lot of great things about it, but it's for simpler spaces. I think that's probably the best way that I can put that. Um, it's a bit more of a cost-effective system if you're looking to do upgrades, um, but you may not have the budget to go to Paradigm. We do have a lot of great things in our Echo line, and if you want to check Echo out more because you haven't had the opportunity, once again, we have it right across the hall. We've got some great demos for you over there. But we have some preset stations there. They look a little bit different than the Unison Heritage ones. I'm trying to see if we have any here. Got them right here. We don't, but they're across the hall. Um, <laughs> Oh yes, they're over here. They are over on the left side. So like you see that nice little dial station. Um, they're the ones kind of with these um, plastic caps on them with the text in there. The nice thing about those is that you can pop out the text in those and put in your own text. You don't have to have them laser engraved like the Unison ones. Um, but really, some of the real difference about the station functionality here is that it's programmed at the station as opposed to in the processor. So when your technician comes out to site to turn on an echo system, they're going to go to the individual button station and work some toggle switches on there to program the lights to them. It doesn't have a processor like this inside of the rack. Echo does have a processor in its rack, but it's not one of these that stores all your station functionality in it. It's pretty much taking in DMX, taking in network, turning on lights. Simple. So what's the other thing we see in here that's a little bit different? A repeater. Who can tell me what a repeater is? It can't, some repeaters can extend the signal. In this case, the DMX one, I think you had brought it up, it's going to split the signal. So kind of like an opto splitter here, what that's going to do is it's going to um, send a DMX out in multiple places. Why might we meet, why might, I can't talk, why might we need that? Here you have DMX ports on your connector strips and you need a way to get your data to your connector strips. Exactly. You need a way to get your data to your connector strips. So what's our DMX topology? Daisy chain. Daisy chain. Okay, so we can't star. So this would be a star or a Y if we didn't have some sort of electric median in there to do that interface for us. Mm -hmm. D, uh, DMX doesn't really play well if you try to daisy chain it on the output side. Um, so what we recommend is splitting the signal out to your DMX devices. If you so, want to know how DMX works, <laughs> talk to me afterwards. Yes. Patrick has been out in the field for a long time. He is a pro at this. But in this case, we have it in here because they've got multiple data points on their connector strips. And we want to make sure that that DMX is functional on there. So we have that. Any questions about the system? So our infrastructure, real quick, our infrastructure now has this repeater in it. All right, so if you think about your infrastructure, you got your Unison cable, you got your DMX cable, and now you got this repeater in here. So that's all part of your infrastructure. Okay, Is yes ma'am. Hang on, real quick, sec hang on. So like your DMX is labeled one, two, and three, but this appears to all be the same universe. So how are you notating different universes versus different in this, in this system, we're not. So it's all one. As we get bigger, they start to, we start to have the ability to look at things differently. Okay. But for this system, it's probably just really simply one, one universe. Um, also notating about the cable numbers on here. A lot of times when we're putting cable numbers in here, this is really for our field technicians. This is for the electrical contractors. This is so that if you are at the station and you're trying to get that station to work, and let's say it doesn't work for whatever reason, we have tagged it with a number so you know where in the system you have a failure. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the point of why we put um, numbers on these drawings. It's showing how many cable runs we need you to have inside your walls and it's helping us determine failure points if it gets to that. So hold that hold that thought. Give me yeah. one more print and I think we're going to go into what you're looking to do, what you're looking to ask. Just for clarity, the cable numbering is literally just a name 
on yes. this, and it doesn't have deeper information the way your other gaming system does. Correct. Correct. And, and, and Correct. some of those are, are dictated by the consultant as well. So the okay. consultant will dictate how the nomenclature works. We have a standard just as ourselves, D is DMX, X is DMX output, U is Unison, okay, N is network. Okay. We have a standardized for ourselves, but that doesn't mean that every consultant's going to do it that way. Mm -hmm. They may do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, whatever. Right? You had a question? Uh, yeah, I see. It's labeling for clarity. The exact same cable. It, it, it is the same cable yep. as the Unison one, um, well, but to be able to differentiate between um, a paradigm system and an echo system, um, we call out that difference. So if you go if you go back to the Unison from previous, it will have that ground wire as well. Fourteen. Yep. And then the and then the Unison with power has two additional wires for the DC. Correct. Correct. It's. What is that? How many? What's made up? What is the? Uh, Eighty-four seventy-one. Yeah. The unison. Yeah. It's yeah, uh, sixteen gauge, line. twisted, but no no shield. It's just normally twisted. Mm-hmm. And. It's not. It's not. It kind of is and kind of isn't. It's not shielded, but yes, it is a twisted pair, quote unquote, and it is sixteen gauge. You can't run two straight 16s because it, it is a digital protocol, so it is subjected to outside interference, uh, but not as susceptible as DMX. One thing to note, since we're kind of getting into the weeds on cable here, is when we <laughs> <laughs> So we recommend some specific cable types. Um, a lot of times somebody will be like, well, can I use this cable type? Maybe. Um, what I haven't shown you is that there's a notes page in our drawing set that has some acceptable wire types that we recommend if you don't want to use this cable. If your electrical contractor were to come back and say, I don't have that cable in stock, I think that cable's expensive, I found this cable at whatever the discount supply store is. Um, we have some cable types that are not this that we have verified with our equipment, but if you use a cable that we have not verified, that we have not called out as an acceptable substitution, and you call us and you say, I have a problem, my station's not working, we're going to ask what cable you have there and we're going to recommend that you change it because our equipment is designated to work with the cable types that we call out. So while that may not be something that people in this class are necessarily going to be like in the walls running cable. Um, it's something to be cognizant of, is that when we test our products, we test them with specific cables, we test specific cable lengths, and these recommendations that we put on here, they're to help you guys. So, just something to keep in mind. But if you ever have a question about, will my cable work, can my system work like this, please call us, we are so happy to help you, so. So is that cable work? What is that? What that yes, okay. it's stamped yep. on the outside. Yep. All, cab all cables stamped right. on the outside. What, what is it marked on that? I mean, like the Bell, uh, for the Unison stuff, it's yeah. built in 8471, okay. and it's stamped right on the side of it, or it's going to be a Carroll equivalent, mm -hmm. or any number of other things. 9729 for DMX, am I memory mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Yep. 9728 for what used to be a uh, remote focus unit, because it's four twisted pairs. DMX is two twisted pairs. We don't use the second twisted pair. But a lot of the older, a lot of our older installations, we didn't use the second twisted pair because there was no, there was no need for the pins four and five. And now some other things have started using those four pins four and five. So our new systems, I think, are starting to get those and using those. RDM doesn't. These are really great questions, you guys. Told you I was a gear guy. <laughs> Don't let me go too far in the weeds. <laughs> Any other questions before we move on to the next one? We'll start adding some things. Is this an all LED setup? Or? Uh, that's a good question. That's a probably that's probably a fairly safe assessment mm -hmm. that it is either an LED or some sort of power supply driven loads that are on the outside. In this case, 
because this one was one of my projects. I remember this one. This one is actually all color source fixtures. It's delivering data to the terminal strips as well mm -hmm. to yep. control what you've just powered on with the reader. Yep. Yep. So if you take a look at this, um, you're going to see DMX are, is running to those connector strips <coughs> on there. Um, we kind of talked about uh, connector strip, how to decode those, the 9.9 being the connector strip series. 4.4 is going to be 44 feet. That's how long those connector strips are, so it's two 44-foot connector strips. 12CO, um, um, those are twist lock outlets. The O means outlets in this case, over three, so over three circuits each. So that's um, 12 physical circuit, or 12 physical outlets um, powered by three circuits. And the one X over one is one DMX universe there and one DMX out. And this guy right here also helps diagnose that because it says three 20 amp circuits. So in so this got, case. So she's got 12 plugs across here, why? Because our LEDs don't draw a lot, of, a lot of current. So we can have a total of 12, but we're only using three circuits. But it, it was a good question. Um, is this an LED system? In this case, it was. This is a really good example of how we can use um, LEDs in theatrical applications. They connect right onto your connector strip. We've got some simple DMX coming into each of them, and they're powered by an echo feed through panel. And it ends up being a more cost effective situation for many spaces. In this case, this is an elementary school. Fantastic. You're making our jobs easy. All right, now we're getting a little more complex. And yes, I know it's going to be almost impossible to read. That's why we handed them out. OK. So we're making a little bit of a jump here. We're going to combine a few things that we've talked about into one bigger system. Um, this is a high school performing arts center just to kind of give you a little bit of information about the job. Um, it's one, um, it's a new construction one that's going on right now. Um, and they, they had a little bit of budget to play with, which is awesome. Because not, not just for us, but we, we like being able to design systems that are really going to be great functional spaces. They're great learning environments for up and coming technicians. I mean, how many of you guys did theater in high school, right? Giving high schoolers the equipment that they can use that's how that's how we get you guys here now. So, we love this stuff. Okay. So, so thank you for your patience cuz now we're going to talk about what you just talked about. So, look yeah. down in the bottom right-hand center where it says two port gateway. All those two port gateways that are connected by in wires in the bottom kind of right. Each one of those can be programmed to be any universe you want it to be. Well, but that's all over cap 5. Right. Correct. Okay. So that's this is where things are going to. Yes. We're going to the to, so the infrastructure then becomes a network infrastructure, and then DMX gets spit out the other end of it. Yes. But does that help? Is, am I on the kind of what you're looking? Um. So way 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 back when I was doing installs, we were doing those hardline DMXs in multi universes. Yes. And it was just another number. Okay. So it'd be D1, D2, universe one, universe two, it, it just whatever the nomenclature we dreamt up that day is what we used to do that. That's starting to become very rare that you have hardline DMX as your only infrastructure backbone. Depending on the age of Well, yes, yes. <laughs> so if you have that system from my vintage, then you're looking at dual cables daisy chaining down the line through your plug-in stations. Yes. Right? And then at some point it goes in a different direction. So it may come from your plug-in stations and one goes to the dimmer rack and then one goes straight out to a pipe somewhere. Is that kind of like what you got? Um, yes. And in some of the spaces, the labeling is very unfortunate. Okay. <laughs> and so... Um, are, these la are these lamacoids on the outside or is this the labeling on the inside? This is... Um, like the printed label at the port on right. the outside. So if I could look at the as built and be like, oh, DMX one on that port is actually universe three. Are they in, are they engraved? Yes. Okay, then yes, I would say if you had your as built, there is probably 
a, it was logical to the consultant, so there should be a logical way that those were, were drawn out. Right. Like, we literally have ports that are labeled, like, multiple DMX numbers, and they are actually all universe one. They okay. Were so unfortunate. Do you, do you have some sort of a... We should talk afterwards. Yeah. You, you have to have... Do you more than likely have some other piece of electronics that's in the, in the mix somewhere that you may not know where it's at? So, um, going back to the system here, um, we had a question earlier of what about the processor? Is it always in the dimming rack? This is a really great example of the processor not being in the dimming rack. So, let's talk about the dimmer racks on here. On your page in front of you, um, you'll notice that we have existing sensor racks that have kind of a dashed line around them. On ETC drawing sets, we dash lines of equipment that is not that is either not provided by ETC or is existing on site already. So in this case, they're repurposing some sensor equipment racks on here. So sensor equipment racks, which are I'm not sorry, dimmer racks, not equipment racks. Um, this is one of the little six module guys right here. They have their own um, CEM3 processor in it, which will take in DMX and will help spit out the information um, to turn on dimmers in here. But you cannot use like these Unison Heritage button stations with this. You can't connect directly to them. It's a different processor than you find in the DRD rack. So we can take this, DR, this processor, this paradigm processor, and we can put it into an external control unit, which we call out as an ERN4 in your wall-mounted uh, wall equipment rack on your drawing set. And then we can connect button stations to it. So you've got your button station. It talks to your processor in your equipment control rack, then the processor is going to talk to the sensor three rack. Does that make sense? So all those button stations that you see on that drawing, while they're not directly connected to the dimmer rack, they still can turn on dimmers. Yes? So all of the dimmers in this space are sensor dimmers, none of them are at all. Correct. 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 Good catch. Good catch. Do they have to be? No, I have a space that's better. I have a unison rack with dimmer sitting next to three sensor racks. Yep. Yep, you can combine them. So they, they can sit on the network. So you can look at N1, N2, and an N2. So it's a network connection between them. You could have a, a unison rack can sit on the network as well. Right? So now why do they have N1 and N2 going to the first rack and then N2 in the second rack? Anybody? Star, star, which means it's pa it just passes through, or it may it may not even go through the rack. It may not come anywhere near it, but it's got to be a direct line. So it's got to be a direct line from the rack back to the switch, and the same thing for the second rack back to the switch. It can't get. Yeah. So the switch in your wall mountable equipment. Yep. That switch is sending network cables to your sensor racks and your gateways. And everything. Mm -hmm. Everything is going through one switch. Okay. It's pretty much the hub right there. All of the signal is coming into that rack, and that network switch is making sure that it gets out to all the different control devices and all the different dimming devices on this too. So he had a really he had a really good question. It's it's not communicating. It's communicating net, network speak. Um, you want to know network stuff, go to the networking class. Lowell will bury you <laughs> with that stuff. Okay? It's speaking something that both the sender and the receiver understands. Mm -hmm. And then the receiver is either interpreting that locally and doing dimming functions or switching functions, or it's spitting DMX out to a multi-parameter fixture. So the network cable going into the sensor rack is speaking ETC net to the sensor rack. Not yes. Correct. Yes. Okay. Okay, Correct. So we also had a question on why um, 
it shows N1 and N2 going into one sensor rack and then spitting out N2 into the next one. It can be a little bit confusing because we've talked about star topology on here and it looks kind of daisy chained. What it actually is, is the electrical drawings showed those two runs in the same conduit. So we mark them as being run together, even though they're not daisy chained. They're literally in the same run. And if I were to, right if I were to, and this is, so as I kind of made a reference to this, um, she, she made reference to page 11 on some of the older ones where you could look back and see what that station looked like. You can do the same thing here, but you're, you actually says sound booth, light booth. So if I, if I didn't have drawings, I would tell you that that plug-in station is two network jacks, two network connectors. Right, because I got a net, I got net five and net six inside the sound booth. I got net three, net four inside the light booth. Go okay, so NG. That's I don't know. You want to jump to that? Why don't we stick? Why don't you finish going through the oh, unison stations, sure. and then we'll touch why NG seven is. Oh yeah, that is. that's a really good question. Okay. So we've got some unison stations that we've seen here before. Can anyone tell me um, how many buttons are on these unison stations? You can't leave until you get it right. Five. Yes, you guys are getting so good at this. All right. So we've got five button unison stations. You can see that we've marked where they physically are in the space. In this case, they're at various entry doors into the theater. Um, we also have one of the portable touch screens that we talked about earlier. But then there's more. There's also one in the wall. Ta-da! So we've talked about those stations. That makes sense to everybody, right? So Let the, in, the NG part of that is the fact that it is a powered. So this one would have to be um, this one has the ground wire associated mm -hmm. with it. Yep. Um, some of our gateways and our touchscreen stations, we recommend that you run an extra ground wire to that when installing it, or that your electrical contract. And these are also PoE. Yep. Yes. We've got five minutes left in this one, um, so we'll do some really quick touch on what the uh, what's in that wall mountable equipment rack. How many of you guys have spaces where you have an equipment rack with like a network switch and a processor? And okay. Good, like half the class. That's wonderful. Uh, that's <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's more fun to install. <laughs> I've lived in those for days. Yeah. So um, what that allows us to do is have a lot of equipment all in one place. Um, so you have that one kind of central point of control in there. Um, it's better than maybe having like a simple network box, which is this guy right here, which is basically a network switch in a box over here, and having a DMX repeater over here, and having a DRD over here, and a, a station repeater station over here. It puts everything into one space. What's the benefit of having everything in one rack? <laughs> Pretty much, right? Single point for failures. Single point for failures. So let's say you're calling up Sasha and you're saying, Sasha, I can't turn my lights on. I, I press something on the button station and I don't see any lights on the button station. I'm not getting any response. Where should you probably go to start troubleshooting that? The rack. The rack. Mm -hmm. You can go to your processor over on the rack. <laughs> As somebody that has worked in dimming rooms in basements and said, "Oh my gosh, I'm going to call I'm going to try what you said and call you back." Nope. I understand. <laughs> we yeah. See, back in the day, you just had a really long phone cord. You just yeah. go downstairs. Right? <laughs> Still have them. So does anyone have any questions about this system? I know we've covered a lot today, and some of you guys might have simpler spaces, some of you guys might have more complex spaces. We've got a question right here. That's a, that's the gate that's the gateway. So that's a it's a version. So you got you got the original ones oh. that had the plug in and plug out modules. Response is just all in one. It doesn't have the replaceable sleds. Oh, okay. 
Are you talking about the zero to 10? Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. I forgot that one was on here. I'm so sorry. I forgot to touch on that. Okay. So who here is going to take the uh, dimming unusual loads class? Okay, oh, we're probably going to be covering zero to 10 volt dimming. Um, it's, what'd you say? We'll absolutely yeah, <laughs> we will absolutely be covering that in another class. They're going to go into a much better explanation than I can give you in the next 30 seconds on that. Um, but Mark and Natalia run that class and they will be able to answer all your zero to 10 volt questions. Um, what I'll briefly say about this system is that that particular gateway um, will, will take a network signal in and then be able to adjust your zero to 10 volt loads for fixtures. Um, maybe they're house light fixtures in your space, um, but basically things that are not dimming line voltage or DMX. It's just another product that we have to help your system. Cool. 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 Peace out. Yeah. Have oh, a nice break. And I we think have evaluation forms um, that are on the app. Correct. They're on. Yep, and we have some so paper ones. You could possibly have like a switcher. Yeah, or something. if you're ETC, or uh, please come up and what they used to do, sign. Um, is they would run those Did lines out because your your expressions have three DMX outputs. Right, right. right and they would hardline all three, and they would send them all down, and they would do this math. You know. We also had uh, back in the day we used to do. Um, you had like a plug panel. Yeah, but your contact in the back where you could switch your DMX.